Denise Dresser plays a unique role in many ways. She is a first-rate scholar. She has a PhD in political science from Princeton and is a professor at ITAM in Mexico City. Her scholarly work is highly regarded, but she is also among the foremost public intellectuals in Mexico. As a citizen, her public voice has been articulate, provocative, original, bold, and insightful. Uh, and in that role in particular, as a columnist for Reforma, as a frequent contributor to Proceso, as a guest uh, on many interview programs and television and radio, last year she won the National Journalism Award uh, for her letter to Carlos Slim. Um, that must have been a letter. <laughs> so it's with great pleasure that Denise is here with us today. She has been a visiting professor at Berkeley in the past, uh, a visitor not frequently enough, and someone we look forward to having part of our intellectual community for the future. So please join me in welcoming Denise Dresser. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I expect that if the PRI wins the presidency, I'll be spending a lot more time here <laughs> at Berkeley. <laughs> um, on one occasion, a singular event, uh, the journalist Julio Scherer asked former President Ernesto Cerillo to speak of his love for Mexico. He asked him to speak of its art, its geography, of the history of the country, of its mountains and its valleys and its sun-laden afternoons. And the former president didn't know how or what to answer. And it's likely that many Mexicans, when asked that question today, wouldn't know what to say either. Today, pessimism uh, runs rampant in Mexico and infects anyone who comes into contact with it. Today, we almost seem obsessed with failure and we are using on a daily basis what I call the vocabulary of disenchantment. You hear it in cabs, you hear it in sobremesas, uh, the ending coffee at the meals, you uh, read about it in the columns, uh, you breathe it in, in the places where at one point we applauded the transition to democracy and now we fear violence. In Mexico, as Elias Canetti, the philosopher, would say, pessimists are superfluous. And the current situation shows us why. These are troubled times of dead and wounded, of veto centers and reforms that have been postponed of priistas, of members of the PRI who have become strengthened, and of panistas, members of the National Action Party who are divided, of citizens who want to scrutinize power, and parties who abuse that power. Uh, times in which there has been an effort to deliberately sabotage Mexico's electoral institutions, and at the same time we've witnessed the self-sabotage of the Mexican left. Every day we read a chronicle of catastrophes, a chronicle of small and large issues of corruption, a chronicle of actors too small for the greatness of the country they live in. Um, although it is true that certain practices of the past have been eliminated by the democratic transition, many institutional vices associated with authoritarianism are still there, there thwarting citizen representation and democratic governability. Mexico isn't walking in a linear direction towards a better economic and political place. We seem to be limping three steps forward and two steps back. Mexico seems to be trapped in a permanent tug of war between the possibility of change and actors who seek to avoid it between uh, uh, a citizenry that demands 
more every day in a political class that seems intent on defrauding those expectations. Because the very celebrated democratic voted transition in Mexico, because we voted the PRI out in 2000, has turned out to be a double-edged sword. Over the past decade, we've seen that political and economic elites have centered their attention largely on reforming the electoral framework of the country without reforming its broader institutional framework. And that framework doesn't work anymore. The political system has become a peculiar hybrid uh, in which a combination of authoritarian remnants coexist with democratic mechanism. Transparency advances in some ways, but opacity prevails. Um, openness continues, but the possibility of closure of political spaces is a real threat. Um, indispensable reforms that the country needs are sabotaged time and again by interests that would see themselves affected by those reforms. Unions and political parties and public and private monopolies have not learned how to adapt to the demands of a more democratic context. On the contrary, they exploit the weaknesses of Mexico's incipient democracy, lobbying to block changes instead of promoting them, resisting demands for accountability, such as is the case with the, nat with the National Teachers Union uh, that is currently uh, leading a movement to avoid teacher evaluation throughout the country, resisting demands for accountability in the style of many unions in Mexico, rejecting um, cuts to public financing of political parties in the way that parties are doing in Mexico today, blocking competition in the style of all of the Mexican multimillionaires on the Forbes list, uh, criticizing the elimination of fiscal privileges in the way in, the way in which uh, the top levels of the business class do, blackmailing the political class in the style of Televisa, conditioning any fiscal or labor reform to the survival of unaccountable elites in the way in which the PRI does. So in the new democratic era, the old demons still exist. The demons of corruption, of patrimonialism, of rent seeking, of the arbitrary use of power, and the impunity with which it is still exercised. And the price of all of this is evident. A low quality democracy, fictitious representation, um, subpar institutional performance, political parties very far removed from the needs of those who they represent, businessmen who always insist that the state charge more taxes, but not to the private sector, political elites adept at making decisions that are highly questionable, corroded by internal divisions, incapable of solving the perennial problems of inequality and violence, prone to populist or authoritarian leadership that they present as a redemptive force in the face of a country that seems incapable of saving itself. All of this is the product of, as I will argue, a political and economic system that is showing great fissures. In Mexico, if you were to visit today, you would hear this on a daily basis, the demand of order, the demand of authority, the petition for a firm hand. Faced with increasing violence, Mexicans invoke those who they believe can combat it. Faced with signs of decomposition, the claims for a restoration begin to grow. Faced with the incompetence of those who have badly ruled over the past 12 years, the invocation to those who ruled the country for the pa previous 71 years begin to grow. And thus Mexico seems to be slouching towards what I call a regrettable Putinization, a uh, mental and political regression to a place where Mexicans are invaded by a sense of nostalgia for strong leadership in the Putin style 
and the authoritarian states that men like him control. And I understand that this temptation emerges faced with uh, the onslaught of criminals, of violence, of those who uh, attack the state and show, display its weaknesses, and where in this panorama there are more and more citizens who are willing to sacrifice their hard-earned democratic gains if security can be achieved. Where in every conversación de café, in every coffee conversation in Mexico, someone claims the use of force, a uh, strong hand, the return of the PRI because at the very least, violence didn't happen with them. Today, Mexi uh, Mexico is in a situation where a democracy for many is associated with anarchy, with weakness, with insecurity. Today, there are those who want a Mexican Putin and the claims for a solution incarnated by those who offer continuity, security, stability, control, that claim grows. And who is offering that in Mexico today? The old PRI, the old PRI, headed by vintage dinosaurs like Manuel Fabio Beltrones and Emilio Gamboa and Ulises Ruiz, offering the PRI with the pretty face of Enrique Peña Nieto and the hand of iron of who was, as was the case with Beltrones, the private secretary of Fernando Gutierrez Barrios, the Mexican version of J. Edgar Hoover. And what is the PRI offering? It is offering to the, all of those who have concessions of a public good the maintenance of their concessions. It is offering business elites the reestablishment of order. It is offering unions the, pres the preservation of their acquired rights, including the acquired right in the National Teachers Union to sell, to inherit, or to exchange uh, the position of a teacher for sexual favors. It is offering, the old PRI is offering to Mexicans the value of experience even if that experience was anti-democratic. And there are the central components of a model of competition that the PRI has constructed and with which it is uh, paving its return. Here are the fundamental ingredients that I'm going to, des to describe of a strategy that the PRI has undertaken and is now preparing itself to win the presidency with. A perfectly um, planned equation with which it is now being, uh, 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 creating a scenario for its return. And what is this equation? Pretty face plus money plus support from Televisa and the networks plus constant publicity plus dinosaurial PRI equal to electoral triumph. This was a formula successfully conceived in the state of Mexico, and now the PRI seeks to instrument it at the national level. I call it el modelo bonbon, the bonbon model, the golden boy model, the Peña Nieto model, with results that are becoming increasingly clear as the polls that present Enrique Peña Nieto 20 or 25 points ahead of his adversaries and the other parties, as the polls show. The PRI has become the beneficiary of an economy that contracted by almost 8% two years ago during the last crisis. The PRI beneficiary of violence and insecurity, which it promises to address by pacting with the cartels and those who lead them. The PRI beneficiary of a PRD that devours itself and a national action party that has betrayed itself. But most importantly yet, the PRI beneficiary of the best investment that it has made in recent times, the permanent PR campaign over the past six years that has created Peña Nieto and that leads many Mexican women to, explain, to exclaim in campaign rallies 
and I'll say this in Spanish because I can find no literal tra or appropriate translation <laughs> for it in English. Peña Nieto, bombón, te quiero en mi colchón. <laughs> Enrique Peña Nieto, the actor of a continuous spectacle, perfectly produced and acted on the largest and most powerful screen of the country, which is Televisa, El Canal de las Estrellas. The candidate of El Canal de las Estrellas that, well, they even found him a girlfriend and then a wife. The candidate that the networks have made their own and they have enabled to create. With political promotion disguised as infomercials, with PR packages that include buying interviews on the main news shows, with the coverage of a romance that frequently receives more attention than the, than the war on drugs, there is a plan that Televisa has put into place and that Peña Nieto follows to the letter. And the plan is, I give you, I give you the screen from which you can propel yourself, and in exchange, you're going to give me a presidency a la medida de mis intereses, to the measure of Televisa's interest, of interest at a, a sexenio, a six-year period in which I can guarantee that the words third open network of television will never be pronounced. <laughs> there is a permanent exchange of favors, money, media, promotion, impunity, all of this so that the PRI can return to Los Pinos, the presidential res residence. This is what I envision in the horizon, the electoral and political horizon of Mexico today an alliance of the oligarchs and the forces of order supported by a population that begin, has be, begun to lose its democratic impetus, the restoration of the firm, but let us not forget, corrupt hand that strangled Mexico for 71 years. Uh, predictable but regrettable Putinization. Now, for many Mexicans and for many uh, people who study Mexico in the United States, it seems that this possibility is not uh, a motive for insomnia or even for concern. They speak of the return of the PRI as if it were a symptom of democratic normalcy, an indicator of the political modernization that Mexico has achieved and it would be unable to, to go back on. Um, they argue that the country isn't the same as it was in 1988, that the PRI would not be able to govern in the same authoritarian fashion that it once did. Um, avoiding, of course, to mention the cases of Coahuila and other states that are, or Oaxaca, that have been ruled by, as if they had been personal fiefdoms by corrupt governors of the PRI. Um, many of these oracles of optimism say that the PRI would be forced to support the reforms that up to now it has blocked. And I wish those voices who are not worried about the return of the PRI to the presidency of Mexico were right. I wish that they were correct. I wish that it were the case that a new era of PRI presidencies were a sign of healthy alternancia and not of regrettable regression. I wish it were true that the country and the PRI have changed enough to avoid the resurgence of the worst practices of the past. But any analysis of the PRI today contradicts that argument that I think is based more on wishful thinking than on a, a cold uh, analytic appraisal of what the PRI is today. As Thomas Friedman wrote in the New York Times last year, in Mexico the, today there are three groups that coexist. The narcos, the nos, and the naftas. In other words, the capos, the beneficiaries of the status quo, and group, social groups to which I belong and to which many of Mexi Mexico's middle class members belong, those who want a, a modern, prosperous, dynamic Mexico, those who have been the beneficiaries of the country's opening to the world. 
Today, by definition, the PRI is the party of the no, the party that opposes necessary reforms due to the rent-seeking interests it protects, the party that rejects citizen candidacies and re-election because of the rotation of elites that it defends, the party that recoils from union modernization because of the acquired rights that it gave those unions, the party that doesn't even want to touch monopolies of any sort, well, because it was responsible for their creation. The party, the PRI and its bases today are the, the no's because they constitute the main opposition to any change that would entail opening, privatizing, shaking up, confronting or remodeling the system that they conceived and that they still live from. The clientelistic, corporatist PRI is still there. It is a party that does not believe in citizen participation or in counterweights or in checks and balances or in the opening of unions to public scrutiny. And regrettably, the PRI today has more governorships, more resources, more discipline, and more hunger than any of its opponents in the presidential race. The PRI today is better positioned to win, and the National Action Party has enabled this to happen. The National Action Party chose I, what I believe was the wrong strategy by giving its, by turning the war on drugs into its main priority above what I believe was the fundamental challenge, which was making the economy grow and providing employment. In the last years, Mexico has witnessed, has suffered levels of violence without precedent. As Fernando Escalante argues in his article in Nexos magazine, um, death has a permit, la muerte tiene permiso, the national rate of homicides grew by 50% in 2008, by 50% in 2009, by 50% again in 2010. The, the ascendant tendency occurred in the second year of Felipe Calderón's administration, and I think it's imperative to understand why. The official explanation has become a cliché. We are told that the homicides are the result of cartels that are fighting among each other, that the violence is the result of a successful strategy and not an inefficacious intervention. We are told that Mexico is a more violent place because desperate criminals are taking themselves on. And then, according to the government strategy, violence becomes acceptable, justifiable almost necessary. And here, I would present you with a series of provocative questions. What if violence in Mexico is used not only by drug traffickers, but also by other armed groups that resort to it to defend what they believe is theirs in the face of the unraveling of authority? What if the war on drugs were not the explanation, but the context? What if violence were not um, the result or the uh, uh, evidence of the power of the state, but rather evidence of its bad imposition at the local level? Because Escalante's numbers show uh, an alarming coincidence. In numerous states, the rate of homicide goes up the minute that the army and the federal police arrive. It seems that the arrival of troops and federal police does not reduce violence. On the contrary, it seems to exacerbate it. Um, the patrolling carried out by the federal police doesn't contain insecurity. On the contrary, it seems to, to lead to a growth in that insecurity. And I understand that this argument seems counterintuitive, but it leads to interesting hypotheses. The arrival of the military frequently brings with it the dismantling of the, of the municipal police in many states. And that police, 
yes, infiltrated, corrupt, co-opted, was the, the, the force in charge of maintaining order through a series of informal, and yes, in many cases, extra-legal pacts. And the disappearance of that police brings with it the, the unraveling of those pacts that maintained peace at the local level. Um, in other words, corrupt peace from below is substituted by the imposition of order from above when the military arrives. And that order imposed from above by the federal executive is too intermittent, too insufficient, too far removed from local reality to assure peace. The presence of the military generates a, a void that any person with a weapon, and Mexicans can get weapons very easily given how they flow through the border on a daily basis, uh, any person with any weapon can fill the void created by the arrival of the military. The presence of the federal police generates an uncertainty that many armed groups take advantage of, whether it be communal farmers or ranchers or people engaged in contraband or ambulantes or private policemen or bodyguards or union leaders or ex-policemen. The, the breaking up of the local order leads to the protection of individual rights. Um, the collapse of the institutional framework leads to the protection of what people believe is theirs with a gun or an AK-47 in hand. And according to Escalante, and I would pose this question, I would pose this hypothesis, there is the clue, therein lies the clue to much of the violence that Mexico faces way beyond the, what the federal executive has been willing to recognize or to take on up to now. Uh, there is the real challenge for Mexico, how to recreate local order, but on the basis of the rule of law and not through the barrel of a gun. And of course, many Mexicans in this audience, I'm sure, would say, would argue that Mexico is paying a high price to satisfy the US's voracious demand for drugs. And yes, that is true. But we, Mexicans, are also paying a high price for our inability to make the rule of law a reality and not a simple rhetorical aspiration. We are also responsible for our incapacity to create an inclusive, prosperous country in which its citizens have well-paid jobs and they don't plant or transport drugs. If that doesn't change, if we continue to live with a permanent subclass of 50 million people, it doesn't really matter how many resources are used, how many policemen are trained, how many guns are bought, how many helicopters, helicopters are brought from the US. Colombia has spent over $10 billion on its own war on drugs with very mixed results. Yes, more security, but same level of drugs. And the lesson for Mexico then should be clear. The main objective that the war that the government wants to win can't only be the destruction of the cartels, but rather the construction of what Mexico has never had, which is the rule of law. The goal shouldn't be only to apprehend or kill more capos, but to actually um, to better the enforcement of the law in a country for everyone. And also to fight this war in a more strategic and intelligent way, as my colleague Eritam Edgardo Buscaglia has argued. And this would entail a strategy that is based less on the apprehension of drug trafficking kingpins and more on the seizure of their goods. A more intelligent strategy would require not only military combat, but also a financial strategy centered on the confiscation of accounts, on going after money laundering, and more importantly, combating corruption in every court, in every municipal presidency, in every governorship where 
drug lords are protected. Because if we don't do that, for every criminal that is apprehended, there will be a criminal that is set free. And for every leader, drug leader, who is extradited, there will be another one who replaces him. For every drug trafficker that is captured, another one will emerge among the millions of unemployed people in Mexico. And aside from this strategy on the war on drugs that I believe has been ill-conceived and ill-implemented, and as a result, the PAN is going to suffer from a punishment vote, punishment vote, there's another major problem that the National Action Party faces, and that is the fact that over the last 12 years, it has basically emulated the PRI and emulated many of its worst practices in office instead of distancing itself from the old regime. The panistas have not known how to confront or dismantle the old regime. And it seems at times that they haven't even wanted to do so. They have emulated everything that the National Action Party, that the PAN was created to combat. Anti-democratic union leaders, corrupt governors, questionable alliances with El Bester Gordillo, courting veto centers, giving out impunity certificates, and viewing the government, as the PRI did for so many years, as a place for distribution of the spoils. And because of that, the PAN is co-responsible for the return of the PRI, because it didn't stop it on time, it didn't denounce it on time. And many people in Mexico today think that if the National Action Party is going to continue governing as the PRI did, perpetuating privileges and empowering elites and constructing clientels, why keep supporting it? As Jorge Castañeda has said, pa priistas en el gobierno, pues mejor el PRI. If we're going to have members of the PRI, of the PAN, acting as if they were priistas in the government, well, let's just bring the PRI back. And while all of this occurs, what happens with the PAN's presidential candidate? Where, well, there is Josefina Vasquez Mota, who smiles and smiles and smiles. <laughs> but she also does something else uh, in, in her uh, presidential campaign that has not gone very far. As the protagonist of uh, the brilliant movie The Incredibles, she is Elastigirl. She stretches herself in one direction and then stretches herself in the contrary direction all within the same day. She is the candidate who tells each group what they want to hear. She is the candidate who can have breakfast with the concesionarios, with the heads of the TV stations in the country, and receive a standing ovation. And then in the afternoon, meet with those who want concessions for indigenous radio. The, the, the enemies of those who lead the TV networks and also receive a standing ovation. She talks about consolidating the work of Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderón, while she also aspires to a uh, possible Mexico, un Mexico posible, that clearly her predecessors were unable to bring about. She can present herself in the same day as the candidate of change and as the avatar of continuity. Josefina is elastic, malleable, and therein difficult to apprehend. It's clear that she is astute. It is clear that she manages the media well. She has been at the helm of two significant secretaries of state. She, uh, uh, prior to be, being a politician, was a motivational speaker. Um, but she claims to be different. And if you were to go to Mexico today, you would see huge billboards of her smiling, saying, Josefina Diferente. But what makes her memorable up until this point is, are not his, her positions, it's her gender. What, in the only way in which her affirmation of being different is true is in the fact that she is a woman. 
In everything else, she represents continuity with the Ban administrations of the past 12 years. She doesn't want to break with Felipe Calderón because she wouldn't know where to go, what to say, what to offer, where to stand. And it's true, she is a woman, and that gives her candidacy a certain novelty. But she is a woman without <coughs> clear convictions. And this is going to, and this explains why she hasn't surged forward in the polls. She speaks a great deal, but she doesn't say very much. She smiles a lot, but she doesn't commit herself. Up to now, her candidacy has been a skirt buttoned up with good intentions. And that will not be enough to confront the fact that the economy is not growing as quickly enough as it should. It will not be enough to counteract the tired view that people have of the National Action Party. If she doesn't begin to assume positions that differentiate her, her, her from Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderón, she will end up being the candidate of the status quo. She will become trapped between an Enrique Peña Nieto that offers the value of experience, albeit corrupt experience, or a Lopez Obrador that offers radical rupture through La República Besucona, the republic of love that he is now pushing forward. She will be trapped between those who say that they know how to govern and Lopez Obrador, who promises to do so in a different fashion. She will be trapped between the, the effort of the PRI to restore itself and the effort of Lopez Obrador to seduce the Mexican population through love. Now, in the speech in which she, was, she assumed her candidacy, Josefina Vasquez Mota told Mexico that the real enemy was Enrique Peña Nieto because of the commitments, los compromisos, the behind the scenes deals that he has established with the oligarchs of Mexico. Well, for her candidacy to actually triumph, she would have to declare how she is going to break her own, her own complicity with those veto centers and with those oligarchs and with those um, those networks that are holding, networks of entrenched power that are holding Mexico back and that explain why the PAN has been able to accomplish so little after 12 years in office. She will have to offer a campaign of contrast with the PRI that turns her into an iron lady and not what she has presented herself as up to now, which is sort of a, a Play-Doh mom. Now, in this, this political scenario in which people like me, independent voters, in, uh, people who have not decided how to vote and who, who today constitute 30% of the Mexican electorate, we are in this position, we don't know who to vote for, to a, a large degree due to the dysfunctionality of the Mexican left, a left that still doesn't know what to do with Andres Manuel López Obrador. I'll be back, threatened Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie Terminator. I'll be back is what López Obrador has told us with his candidacy in the year 2012. And this is not good news for Mexico. And it is not good news, unfortunately, for the Mexican left because it is going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for Lopez Obrador to surmount the distrust that, it, that his post-electoral behavior in 2006 created among undecided voters who will be those who ultimately decide this race. He is someone who put the Mexican left in a very difficult position from which it's going to be hard for the left to come out of. And for those of us who believe that Mexico needs a functional left, there have been few things as sad 
as to witness its self-sabotage over the past five years. The wounds it has inflicted upon itself, the suicidal role that the Mexican left has played since 2006. The left immersed in a logic of confrontation that has weakened its prestige and presence after winning almost 35% of the vote in 2006. The PRD transformed in the involuntary promoter of the PRI. Lopez Obrador transformed into the involuntary promoter of the return of the PRI, responsible of a re for a regression that he has contributed to as a, uh, 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 as a paradoxical, paradoxical politician who heads a Mexican left that seems intent on empowering the PRI, a Lopez Obradorista left that instead of acting as a counterweight to a revived PRI explains its advance because many votes from the Mexican left have been torn off by the PRI. Lopez Obrador is the redemptive politician who offers, who promises to alleviate poverty, but does not explain to Mexico's middle classes how he's going to create wealth. He is a social leader who doesn't know how to behave in a campaign as a professional politician, and who doesn't understand that in order to get himself elected, he has to move towards the political center and lead a modern, social democratic, inventive, creative left from there, who doesn't understand that this is precisely what led to the victories of people like Lula and Ricardo Lagos and Tony Blair and Michelle Bachelet, a left that knows how to transform resentment into practical public policies, a left that knows how to combat insecurity, but also knows how to present proposals for social mobility. And Lopez Obrador has been unable up to now to show that he thinks and acts in that way. And therein, the questions that surround him continue to be legitimate. Because over the past five years, sometimes he falls into provocation, sometimes he promotes reconciliation, sometimes he grabs the machete, other times he extends his hand, sometimes he talks about the total refounding of the republic, other times he talk, talks of simply, of simply remodeling it. <coughs> <coughs> And therein the doubts that his candidacy generated, generates, therein the fears that he still elicits, therein the mistrust that surrounds his effort in this presidential race. We now see a Lopez Obrador who loves and wants to be loved. But the problem with this posture is that I think it's going to be impossible for him to surmount the distrust that his behavior generated, as I said earlier, with independent voters. Um, because the republic of love does not offer enough practical proposals for people to understand why the left should be in power in Mexico. Because in order to present himself as an alternative a real alternative, Lopez Obrador would have to tell us what he plans to do with Femex, what he plans to do with Carlos Slim, who he defends, what he plans to do with many of the union leaders who form the base of his party and who represent many of the worst practices of Mexican corporatism. John Lennon used to, think, used to sing that all, we, all you need is love, but in the case of Lopez Obrador, it's become clear that that is not the case. <laughs> now, this is what I see in the political scenario for Mexico. How does this become intertwined with our economic reality? Well, Tom Friedman also has written that when the tide goes down, we discover who isn't wearing a bathing suit, <laughs> referring in this way to the, the, the revelatory power of economic crises. And the crisis that Mexico suffered two years ago, and the crisis that it, it, is in, it is encountering at the global level, particularly with the decline of the US economy, um, these crises have desnudado, have, have 
taught, taken, have revealed Mexico's nudity, a country in which 50.1 million people live officially under the poverty line, a country that has managed to create the largest fortune on the planet that lives side by side with 19.5 million people who do not have enough money a day to eat. A country that every year descends in global indicators of competitiveness, of productivity, of education. A country that is being left behind by its competitors, Brazil, Russia, India, India China, swimming without a suit in uh, a sea in which only the economies that are capable of growing quickly will be able to maintain themselves afloat. And why, why has this been the case? Because oil has functioned like a lifesaver. It has, it has hidden the nudity, it has hidden the defects, it has financed Mexico's lethargy. Mexico has been able to nadar de muertito Without, without having to reform its economy in a fundamental way, without having to undertake measures that would make its economy much more dynamic and competitive and open, we are only now beginning to discover what the oil bonanza of the past years has submerged. Mexico has been unable to create internal motors, internal engines of economic growth that promote investment, promote employment, and raise the tide enough so that the poor can jump on that rising tide. And the reason for our subpar performance can be explained, as Santiago Levy does so in his latest book, in the persistence of interests that have been able to block changes that would make the Mexican economy more productive. Imagine hungry sharks accustomed to living off the rents of oil, accustomed to living off uh, the public budget, accustomed to living off federal transfers to the states. We have created a protective, a system of protective fiefdoms of uh, supported monopolies, of coddled unions, of distorted markets. And in the face of this, what Mexico can no longer do is keep on floating, keep on wasting its time, keep on ignoring its unity, its, its nudity, keep on thinking that it's not necessary to rethink the fundamental tenets of its economy because the tide is coming down and it is trapping the country in, it is trapping the country without a suit, but only in this year with the creation of five million more poor people. These are the costs of not reforming ourselves quickly enough, of not promoting the necessary competition, the indispensable productivity, the desired competitiveness, the necessary efficiency. And we are told that this doesn't occur that the reforms haven't taken place because Mexico has a divided government. We are told that the problem is that we have a political system in which parties have few incentives to collaborate and therein the president can't forge legislative majorities. We are told that uh, Mexico is prostrate because of the lack, the absence of legislative majorities that the president can control. I believe that this is an incorrect diagnosis. I think that Mexico has been paralyzed for the past 12 years or 18 years, not, to the, not due to the absence of consensus or the absence of legislative majorities. I would argue that there already is a tacit consensus that has been forged over years between select politicians, businessmen, union leaders, governors, and other beneficiaries of the status quo. It is a pact for the no. It is a pact so that, the, that necessary and deep reforms that, affect, that would affect historically protected interests do not occur. It is a pact so that those who take wide, big slices of Mexico's economic pie, such as Mr. Slim and Mr. Zambrano and Mr. Salinas Pliego and Mr. Azcárraga, 
so that those slices of the pie could become smaller in order to create a bigger pie for everybody. But that is not the case. And why isn't it the case? I would argue that every day we see majorities forged in Congress. But they, those majorities approve legislative initiatives that seek to block change instead of to promote it. Look at the budget. The budget that is not geared towards promoting development, but rather towards sending off unaccountable transfers to the state governorships. Or look at the initiative that that does it, that uh, um, gives tax breaks to new entrants in telecommunications, a clear gift to Televisa. Every day we see majorities in Congress, but they are majorities that preserve instead of transforming. Majorities created by deputies and congressmen by interests that they want to protect, including their own. So allegedly forced to do so by the veto centers that nobody wants to take on. Forced to do so by the acquired rights in the unions that they say nobody can take on. Forced to do so by privileged <coughs> businessmen who always demand that the government of Mexico act, but find it unacceptable that the, that the Mexican government act against them such as in the task of fiscal reform or promoting competition. What am I saying? Many in Mexico demand reforms, but always in somebody else's sector. And when those reforms are approved, even in a timid fashion, the veto centers of the country dilute them or manage to postpone them. The country has become tra entrapped by a foundational corporatist pact that is very difficult to modify because those who should remodel it live very well. What did the National Action Party um, know or understand or find out when it reached the presidency and power in Mexico? Que era bien padre. <laughs> there are the parties with their armored budget regardless of whether the country faces an economic crisis or not. There are the businessmen with their high, the monopolistic businessmen with their high barriers to entry to competition and their captured regulatory authorities and their, and their bought off congressmen and their judicial stays and their armies, the, uh, the amparos, and their armies of accountants to elude taxes within the framework of the law. There are their governors with the, the federal transfers that they receive, which they can spend basically any way they want. And there is the National Action Party, afraid of taking on these vested interests for fear that they would seek political and electoral refuge with the PRI, something that has happened anyway. Mm -hmm. That is the problem with Mexico. It is the rent-seeking pact. It is the extractive pact. It is the pact whereby privileged elites in the country have been able to appropriate themselves of the wealth of others. And who are those others? The citizens and the consumers of my country. And political and economic elites in Mexico have spent decades enriching themselves through rent seeking. Rent seeking that is practiced by the government, by businessmen, by unions, by parties, Rent-seeking built on the basis of economic transactions, beneficial for numerous interest groups, but very, very bad for Mexican consumers. And if anyone here has a Mexican cell phone, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Predatory rent-seeking based on contracts given out to family members of politicians. The protection to monopolies and concessions made on regulation, the control of public goods on the part of oligarchs disguised as national champions. What do I frequently hear? Oh, yes, Denise. Well, Carlos Slim may be a monopolist, but he's our monopolist. <laughs> that is what is holding Mexico back, the assured payment to workers in public unions at the, independently of their productivity, the use of the power of blackmail by those vested interests to capture Congress and block reforms, subvert Mexico's democracy, and block the development of markets, perpetuate the power of these rent-seeking elites, and keep on 
keep on extracting wealth from its citizens. The problem with Mexico isn't the lack of accords or legislative majorities, and that's why I'm so reluctant to give Enrique Peña Nieto what he wants. He wants a, what he says the country needs, a legislative majority. Because that legislative majority, what would it do? prolong this very unequal pact that leads to the concentration of wealth in very few hands. It's an inefficient pact because it blocks accelerated economic growth. And worse, it is a self-perpetuating pact because those who benefit from it don't want to change it. It is a corporatist pact that we as citizens will have to promote, be rewritten in order for Mexico to achieve its true potential, potential that it indeed has. So the question for Mexico is how to change the rules of the game, how to emulate what other countries with top heavy, imagine Mexico's economic structure as a triangle with benefits concentrated at the tip. What have other countries done with top-heavy economic structures, with public and private monopolies that strangled their economies? Well, remember when the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies dominated US markets? They could, as Carlos Slim and others in Mexico, behave as they wanted. And little by little, the public began to raise its voice. The uncontainable power of the robber barons led to a progressive movement, ultimately championed by Theodore Roosevelt. The owners of the government of the United States are the capitalists, he railed. The government has become the adoptive son of the vested interests, he denounced. And then his government devoted itself to breaking them up or regulating them better. I think that the fundamental defining challenge for Mexico is to reproduce that liberating experience, reform and regulate in the name of the public interest and level playing field capitalism. And for that, the Mexican government, regardless of who is elected, needs to send unequivocal signs about how it is going to deactivate those veto centers that are blocking economic growth and democratic consolidation. They have a first and a last name. Abusive monopolists, rapacious unions, blackmailing television networks, unaccountable governors, and their allies in the state and local and federal government. For Mexico to do more than dither economically, important decisions that unleash economic growth, strengthen the regulatory capacity of the state, and contribute to enhance competition, innovation, and productivity need to take place. And in the political realm, Mexico needs to recognize that the dysfunctional democracy that we've put into place needs to be reformed given the lessons that we've learned over the past 12 years since Vicente Fox was elected. The political and electoral system created in the 1990s is exhibiting foundational flaws. It was created to assure the rotation of party elites, but not to assure the representation of citizens. It was created to promote competition among parties, but not to force them to be accountable. As my friend and colleague Juan Pardinas argues, Mexican democracy is like a green dog. It's very exotic. It's unusual. It's unusual insofar as it doesn't permit re-election for any political position, and therein doesn't create incentives for accountability. It's unusual insofar as it doesn't permit citizen candidacies. It does not allow for referendums. It is very Mexican in its absence of mechanisms for transparency and accountability. And Mexican green dog democracy is exceptional in terms of its institutional design and worse off for it. On the back of this green dog sit the defenders of the status quo. Because without re-election, there are no incentives for accountability or citizen representation or a way of weakening local fiefdoms. Without independent candidacies, there 
is no way of breaking the monopoly that political parties have established over political life. Without mechanisms like referendums and plebiscites, there is no way of involving the population in the definition of fundamental national issues. Without class action and other forms of collective action, there's no way of promoting public policies that parties don't want to touch. In other words, we have to support reforms that would diminish the exceptionality of Mexican green dog democracy, force the parties to be more accountable, domesticate the green dog, and place it in the litter of more normal democracies, democracias más normalitas. And why keep pushing for this? Why year after year, forum after forum, time after time that I've been here in Berkeley, um, why keep on doing this as the news coming out of Mexico becomes progressively worse? Where, well, here I'll stop and quote Bertolt Brecht who asks, and in dark times, will there be song? Yes, there will be the song of the dark times. And I think that is the imperative for Mexicans from all walks of life to take up the task of doing so, of continuing to sing and demand and denounce and fight even in dark times. Because it, because it is precisely the resignation, the complicity, the silence and the impassibility of so many that explains why a country as majestic as Mexico has been so badly governed. And our task as analysts, as citizens, is to hold up a mirror so that Mexico can view itself with the honesty that it deserves. Our task is not, as President Calderón has demanded, to speak well of Mexico, but rather understand that the most important intellectual obligation that we have is to pay tribute to the country our country by criticizing its flaws because we know and we can envision how it can be better. And finally, our task is to ask others to be part of the rescue team of a country sequestered by violent criminals and venal governors and rent-seeking monopolists and unaccountable political elites, a rescue team formed by those who refuse to be spectators in the face of injustice, stupidity, or political regression, a rescue team created by those who expect more and criticize Mexico because they are tired of what poet Carlos Pellicer called the absent splendor, el esplendor ausente, those who sing in the dark because it is the only way to illuminate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we have time for, yes. for questions and answers. So please just raise your hand and identify yourself and let's begin a conversation. joke saying that, that I would spend more time in Berkeley. Unfortunately, um, Mexico is forced to choose not between black and white, but between different tones of dark gray. <laughs> and in my view, and this is my personal view, the PRI is worse than the fun. Uh, why? Because 
Um, I think that the PRI is responsible for many of, for the, the creation of that corporatist pact that I have spoken of. Uh, the structural problems that we are dragging behind us, many of them have to do with the way in which power was set up by the PRI and by many of the privatizations ill-conceived and ill-instrumented by Carlos Salinas that led to the installation of those private monopolies that simply supplanted or, or, or um, were put in place of the public monopolies. I think the PRI is responsible for Mexico's crony capitalism. And we don't use that term very frequently to refer to Mexico, but I think it is applicable and it, it describes the system we have. Now, um, that said, why would the PRI be different? Because there is one thing that I grant the National Action Party, uh, a, a fundamental change that has indeed occurred, and it has to do with freedom of expression. Uh, it is a party that has been inept. It is a party that has not broke, tried to break with the vested interests. It is a party that, as I said, emulated or, or felt it, didn't take on the old regime with enough intelligence. Um, and I think the blame for that resides more with Vicente Fox for his weakness than it does with Felipe Calderón, who actually tried, who submitted legislative reforms that when were, were thwarted by the, by, 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 by the PRI. Um, Vicente Fox said during his presidential campaign that he would sacar a las tepocatas, las alimañas y las víboras prietas de los pinos. And he ended up, you know, acurrucadas con ellos, um, next to them. He, 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 he uh, I always say that in, a, in order to understand Vicente Fox, you only have to understand a couple of things. And I'm going to say this in Spanish because it doesn't work if I do it in English. Um, eh, frente al PRI se rajó, con Andrés Manuel López Obrador se obsesionó, Con Marta Sagún se casó. Uh, and that explains the, the failure of an administration that, because of the political void it created, it allowed those veto centers to grow in the absence of presidential leadership. Um, but that said, that said, uh, if I had to choose between different shades of gray, I personally would not vote for the return of the PRI because I think that they will try to recreate the system that they put in place and, and so successfully maintained for 71 years. I, uh, I don't know who I'm going to vote for, but I do know who I'm not going to vote for. Because even now you start to see a PRI that does not want to be accountable. Enrique Peña Nieto has been asked to debate uh, along with all the other candidates in public forums. And he has become the boy in the plastic bubble uh, who, who is reluctant to take to do town hall meetings, who is reluctant to go to universities. And what does that reflect? It reflects, uh, first of all, I think, insecurity for the fear that, that he would make mistakes. But also, I think it reflects a certain disdain towards the citizenry that he does not want to engage with. And people like me have felt fared better over the last 12 years in terms of our ability to speak out. In that, I think the PAN has been very different from the PRI. Uh, the, the restrictions placed on freedom of expression have been much less. And we've been able to take advantage of what in many ways was bad for the country, you know, the, 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 the absence of presidential leadership, but in the same way that the veto centers have stepped into the public fold, so have, so have citizens' movements and social media and other groups in Mexico taken advantage of the democratic transition and carved out small, uh, albeit threatened, uh, spaces of, of, of political action. Yes. <laughs> And you, you talk about these dinosaurs that are uh, like in the free. And I would like to know if, in your opinion, there are some other powerful nations, maybe, or another type of oppressors that we are not considering in this election. Because we are very focused on the free and free 
well, bad and bad, but who's behind them? Would you say that there are some other powerful oppressors behind them? Oh, I, I think the the. Who's, who's behind the PRI? I mentioned it in the talk. I said this is an alliance of the party and the oligarchs and the forces of order. And they, I mean, I, 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 I can mention them um, very clearly. Uh, who is supporting the PRI? Those who don't want level playing capitalism, level, level playing field capitalism in Mexico. Those who are the beneficiaries of, the, of this structure. Um, I, I didn't mention it in the talk, but I, I have all of these numbers on the concentrated nature of the Mexican economy. Who wants the PRI to come back? Those who don't want competition, whether it be in telecoms, in financial services, in energy, in education, in union representation, in all of the mar in cement, in all of those markets where you have people uh, who 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 are who benefit from a, a very oligopolistic, monopolis, monopolistic economic structure who have used the political system to basically uh, support their privileged position in the Mexican economy. And they, are, they, they feel that if they support someone like Enrique Peña Nieto, you will see the elimination of the word competition or third television network or com uh, competition in the cement market or in many other of these concentrated markets. I think those are the, the or, or uh, El Becer Gordillo or Carlos Romero de Champs or um, Joaquin Gamboa Pascoy or any of those uh, atavistic union leaders who want to preserve the extraordinary privileges that Mexican public unions have. I think those are the, those, uh, those are the groups that are supporting a return to the status quo. So in other words, there are other oppressors. They're not just in the parties. I think the parties are an instrument. Yes, go ahead. Could you, uh, thank you very much for, um, for your discussion. Could you talk about the Catholic Church and its role in um, uh, the cause of change and the dynamics? You know, we've got an election coming up. The Pope visited. Uh, uh, Mexico, we went to Guanajuato, didn't go to the, uh, Mexico City. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Um, there's one very interesting fact about the Pope's visit to Mexico, and, and it is that he did not meet, as he has in other countries, with the victims of, uh, of um, how do you say in English, pederastia? Um, uh, 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 yeah, he did not meet with the victims of child molestation uh, the victims of Marcial Maciel, the founder of the Legionarios de Cristo. And I think the, the fact that that did not occur when the Pope has met with victims in other countries tells you all you need to know about the Mexican Catholic Church and its opposition to change. Um, the Catholic Church in all uh, probability will uh, support the return of the PRI because what has the PRI done uh, in order to, um, to 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 get out of being with the Catholic Church? It has supported the criminalization of abortion in 18 states over the past six annual. Um, and this is quite unusual. In the in the past, the PRI simply did not express itself on issues of abortion and made uh, contraception available through all of its public institutions, the INS and the East End and so on. Uh, and abortion was illegal, but authorities turned a blind eye to it. Now it is specifically criminalized in 18 states. If you have an abortion, you will go to jail. And Beatriz Paredes was the person in charge of leading this assault uh, from the part of the PRI which the Catholic Church is very happy with. So I think the Catholic Church, uh, and, and I'm, I'm generalizing here because I think that there, there are many uh, obispos at the local level, Raul Vera and others come to mind, who are very progressive. But the hierarchy of the church, el Episcopado Mexicano, and I'm speaking here of people like Norberto Rivera and Onesimo Cepeda, uh, who all appear prominently in a recent book I read, uh, about the secrets that the Vatican knew about Marcial Maciel and chose to not reveal uh, over the past 40 years. Uh, I think that, that that hierarchical structure 
is very much in favor, first of all, of the left never winning because of the legalization of abortion in Mexico City. And uh, I think it, 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 is, it is a party, I mean, it, the, the church might even feel uncomfortable with Josefina Vasquez Mota as a woman being uh, the fund's presidential candidate, given the conservatism in its ranks. Uh, yes, back there. Can you really trust the role that plays uh, Peña Nieto on top of the election? And also, what can we do as Mexicans living in this country to, to help the democratization of Mexico? Well, I think you might want to look at a website called ADN Politico that's run by CNN Mexico. And what it has is a poll of polls. It, it puts together on a daily basis all of the polls and then shows you a trend. And in the poll of polls, which brings together every poll that is done from GEA ISA, from Parametria, from Reforma, El Universal, and it shows that Peña Nieto is above by a lot. And it shows Josefina declining over the past, since her, her candidacy was officially <coughs> announced. And it shows Lopez Obrador gaining but by very little. And it shows that, that, that Peña Nieto, I mean, um, what Vasquez Mota and López Obrador almost at the same level with 21, 22, 23 percent of the vote, and uh, Peña Nieto up to 48, 49, 50 percent of the vote. So there's a, a very, very large difference. Now, we still have a, a ways, a, a, some time to go, and there will be two debates. But it, and, and something could change, as it changed in the last presidential election when if anyone had said to a political analyst, Felipe Calderón is going to be president of Mexico two months prior to the election, uh, we would have been laughed out of the room. So uh, let's wait and see what happens. But I do believe that the PRI has many structural advantages in its favor right now. Um, what, what do you do living abroad? Well, I think. Um, I recently wrote a book called El País de Uno, Reflexiones para Entender y Cambiar a México. And the reason I did so is because every conference I gave, I got a question like that one, which is, what can we do? And I wrote this book in order to respond to that question. It has, aside from offering a diagnosis of Mexico, it tries to present uh, a citizen manual, you know, 10 steps on how to become an active, participatory, critical um, citizen in Mexico. And I think that living abroad, you have, what you can do is to use social media, which is becoming an increasing force for change and for accountability in Mexico. Uh, mechanisms like Twitter and like Facebook, and, and you'll see that there are all sorts of movements out there um, supporting re-election, uh, being critical of Peña Nieto, demanding debates, that there be 12 debates instead of only two. You know, all of those things that, that, that uh, contribute to pressure political elites into changing. Because uh, what is the essential argument of, of what I've presented today? That we have a self-perpetuating pact that works very well for political parties and for economic elites and works very badly for its citizens. And where are the incentives for change going to come from? They're not going to come from those sitting very comfortably at the top of the pyramid. Uh, because those sitting at the top of the pyramid, why would they want to change the system? It works very well for them. Um, I remember o Obama's day saying during his presidential campaign that, that uh, power never concedes without a, a fight from below. So power in Mexico is never going to make gracious concessions to its citizens if demands are not made clearly from below. And we can make them to, 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 to the extent that the voto nulo was a force, the annulment of the vote in 2009 was a force. You, you, you're now seeing a political reform approved in Congress that has certain elements of what we pushed for, including citizen candidacies, candidacies plebiscites, referendum, iniciativa ciudadana. We're still fighting for re-election, but that's a, a, a much harder battle to fight because Mexicans have been indoctrinated by their libros de texto gratuito 
for 80 years to think that re-election is bad for them when it is something they should be out on the streets demanding. You know, re-election with term limits in order to force accountability from congressmen who don't get re-elected, they simply jump to another position. No tenemos reelección, pero sí tenemos trampolín. <laughs> saltan de la Cámara de Diputados al Senado y luego a, a una presidencia municipal y de regreso a la Cámara de Diputados sin haber rendido cuentas jamás. So, you know, find a cause. There are so many. And attach yourself to it, whether it be re-election, whether it be the legalization of abortion throughout the country, whether it be the reduction of party financing by 50%, which I think we should be demanding given Mexican uh, democracy is the most is one of the most expensive in the world. Um, citizen candidacies, accountability of unions, that Mexicans that unions open up uh, uh, to public scrutiny the way in which they spend public money, which would be a way of taking power away from El Bester Gordillo and Romero de Champs and all the others who rule those unions as if they were personal fiefdoms. So that would be my recommendation. Um, you just mentioned El Bester Gordillo, and I'm really interested in the power that she wields over the teachers union. Um, I think it's assumed that she has the power to mobilize the teachers when it comes to voting. And although she said that she doesn't have, she doesn't have that power because she doesn't have all the phone numbers. But uh, <laughs> in your opinion, what will happen if and when Ernesto Peña Nieto becomes president? In terms of her role, what will she play in 2012? And will there be any change, or what is necessary for educational reform? In I want. <laughs> I once jokingly said what was necessary for that to occur and got into a lot of trouble. Um, what would be necessary for educational reform in Mexico? Well, um, the, the, the problem is that since El Bester Gordillo was put into power by Carlos Salinas, Carlos Salinas who's still view, viewed as the modernizer of Mexico by many, um, education became a a political booty. Uh, it, it became something that could be negotiated a, in return for political support. Uh, education wasn't viewed as, or nor is it viewed today, as a trampoline for social mobility. It is viewed as a source of votes or political control or political stability. What would need to happen? Well, for the next president to break completely the political ties with the teachers union and force a truly democratic election within the, 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 the teachers union. Um, that would require a lot of political courage because what does El Vester Gordillo say? That the, the teachers are a factor of social peace. A statement where with which she threatens that if the interests of the union are affected, she's going to tell those, I think, over one million teachers, we don't even know how many teachers there are in Mexico, there's no padron, uh, to take to the streets. And even, let's say that only 10% of them did so, 100,000 teachers blocking major arteries, highways, avenues throughout the country, demanding not to be evaluated, as is the case today. Um, it would require political courage. It would, requ it would require uh, going against a base of support that every incoming candidate or every president has wanted and needed. And El Becer Gordillo sells her love, and she sells it very expensively. Uh, uh, she, she, it, 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 we, we tend to put all the blame for the state of education on her shoulders when it takes two to tango. And who, who has been dancing the tango with El Becer Gordillo since 1989? Carlos Salinas and Ernesto Cedillo and Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderón. You know, she blackmails and the others let themselves be blackmailed because they want the votes that her, her party provides and they want the, pol the assurance of political stability that her union provides in return for um, not being evaluated in return for, what is the, the, one of the most recent things they asked for, and I tweeted this, was, oh yes, a bono, el bono de la puntualidad. An extra bonus for arriving on time to class. 
And aside from that, they, get, they already have the right to inherit their position to their children, even if their children do not um, uh, go to a normal in order, in order do not uh, attend a teacher's school in, in order to become teachers. So this is another one of, of those, those privileged fiefdoms. In order to break it, you would need a president who is willing to pay the political cost of taking on someone. And, and, and I, I think we need to take her on. I, I, I think that if, if, a, if, if a Mexican president appealed to the broader citizenry and said, uh, the teachers are going to mobilize, let's counter mobilize. And yeah. every, every person who knows how to teach is going to be volunteering in those schools to take the positions of the teachers who are out marching on the streets. I think learning how to play democratic politics appealing to citizens is the way in which you could break that stranglehold. But I don't see a president or a candidate today with willing to do so or to state so publicly. Uh, unfortunately, we have time for one more quick question. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, I, I fundamentally agree with, with your view on the, on the political field, but I think that, uh, wouldn't you agree that the left, especially in, in, in Lopez Obrador's uh, shoulder, sort of, um, has sort of inherently misunderstood, and part of the, of the, of the suspicion by the Mexican middle class uh, comes from that campaign in 2006, which uh, puts him uh, on, as a, at the same level as Hugo Chavez, when he's really not. When he, he has a, 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 a Fernando Urner as, as, a, as a secretary, of, possible secretary of the economy, who's saying that, who's, who's a businessman from Monterrey, quite not, not very socialist or, or anything of that matter, and he's saying we just need to make the economy grow, uh, push for, for, for investment by the private sector, and so don't you think that's, that's part of the equation too? Well, no, of course, uh, yes, Lopez Obrador was a victim of a very successful, very dirty, political campaign against him in 2006, in which he was portrayed as uh, uh, un peligro para México, a threat to Mexico. And he didn't vaccinate himself correctly. He didn't respond as he should have at the time. What should have López Obrador have said when he was portrayed as uh, un peligro para México? He should have come out with spots of his own, reminding people of everything that had happened under PRI rule. And then he should have come out and said, si, sí, soy un peligro para México. Soy un peligro para los monopolistas abusivos y las televisoras chantajistas y los sindicatos corruptos. I mean, he didn't manage it well during the campaign. And then what happened? After the campaign, he did become a danger for Mexico when, when he, he, he organized the Plantón on Reforma and, uh, a, 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 and, and shouted al diablo con sus instituciones, to hell with your institutions, and basically tried to, uh, uh, he reinforced every negative perception that had been created about him. And given that, even though he, let's say he, 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 you know, his chief economic advisor tomorrow were Larry Summers or, 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 uh, or, or Ruben. <laughs> no, I mean, at the most orthodox uh, neoliberal economist, he would still not be able, I think, to surmount the perceptions about his candidacy because he promised, he promised that he would abide by the results of the election in 2006. He said so publicly, and then he didn't. And I think people tend to remember that. And they remember uh, the raised fists, they remember the presidencia legitima, they remember the six years in which he traipsed around the country denouncing Calderón and calling him Pecal and calling him uh, uh, El Espurio. And uh, his conversion into a love-seeking moderate over the past six months, I, I, th I think, is not going to work to eradicate the perceptions that he helped contribute, he helped build for himself uh, since 2006. Why is he the candidate then for the PSD? Uh, I think out of hubris. I think uh, I, I think out of out of. Uh, 
um, uh, how, how, how do you say when, when, when someone keeps on doing the same thing over and over again? Um, Insanity. Uh, no, 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 not, not, not compulsive, but stubborn. But stubborn yes, <laughs> uh, out of hubris, out of stubbornness, out of a misreading of the political climate. I think the left would have fared better under a moderate like Marcelo Ebrard. Uh, um, but if, for him, I, I think it, 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 it also was part of a, a personal grievance, you know, to, to a, a, as one of his biographers has called, his comeback now is la revancha. It's his opportunity to show that he could, to, to get even when I think that all is, that's going to happen is that he will come in a, in a very far distant uh, second or, or third place. And it's going to take the Mexican left, I think, a very long time to dig itself out of the hole that it's currently in. And I say that with, with great personal sadness. I'd like to thank Denise Stresser very much. Thank you.